So welcome to our event, Show Up for History, Decolonizing the Nation of Immigrants Myth with Dr. Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz. This event is organized by College of Marin's Emoja Equity Institute and sponsored by College of Marin's Puente Learning Community and Umoja Learning Community. And so we'd love to know who's present with us today. So if you can, we ask that you take a few moments to respond to our roll call poll that should be broadcast to you shortly. So if you see the roll call, please respond so we can know you're here. So again, thank you all so much for joining us on a beautiful Friday. My name is Yashika Crawford. I'm a faculty member in our behavioral sciences department and proud Emoja team member. And so I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about the Emoja Equity Institute. It was established in the year 2020 in response to the movement for racial justice. It serves in providing uh, professional development, program development, and to advocate in support of increased racial equity at the College of Marin and the community at large. One of our favorite proverbs that we hear from our coordinator, Professor Walter Turner, is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go fast, uh, go far, go together. Uh, the faculty, students, staff, and administration of the Emoja Equity Institute are committed to working collaboratively with our campus and community partners to ensure successful implementation of anti-racist, equity-minded practices at COM campuses and in Marin County. And so the team of the Puente Learning Community is a partner in this work. I am pleased to introduce you to Professor Blaze Whitleaf, faculty in College of Marin's College Skills and English Departments and co-coordinator for the Puente Learning Community. Please welcome Professor Whitleaf as she brings you greetings. Greetings, I'm really excited to have you all here. I'm really excited that we're co-sponsoring it. So I am one of the co-coordinators. My partner, um, Dr. Luz Moreno is not able to attend today. So I'll be representing for the team. And I see a few of our students in the part, uh, participation list, so yay. So in case uh, you wanna know a little bit more about Puente, it's a nationally award-winning transfer preparation program in California community. Uh, more than half of the community colleges in California, about 65 or more, and some of our high schools, as well as it's expanded into Texas and we're starting to have a few programs um, using that model in Washington state. The Puente Project mission is to increase the number of educationally disadvantaged students who enroll in four-year transfer, uh, transfer and enroll in four-year universities, earn college degrees, and return to their community as leaders. Um, what we do, how we do this is we build a community through having our students in transferable English courses for a year. Those courses focus on Latinx experiences and readings. Uh, we have comprehensive counseling until they transfer, mentoring from professional mentors as well as peer mentors. We connect with and help educate their families about the college process, and we take field trips to university. We've been operating at the College of Marin since 2008, and the majority of that time I've been the English instructor, which has been a real honor. Um, we serve annually about 110, 120 students uh, as they go through the program and continue finishing their coursework. The majority are first-generation Latinx students, many of them immigrants or children of immigrants or dreamers. Based on our institutional research, our Puente students are more likely to persist in their English and succeed in it, to stay enrolled, to become transfer prepared and complete um, their college degrees uh, at College of Marin. If anyone is interested in the program, uh, we're always looking for new mentors. And if you, you are a student or know someone who might be interested, um, I'm gonna paste into the, um, into the, the chat our email, uh, as well as the page for our webpage for more information. So very excited to be here and looking forward to the talk. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Professor Whitley, for your warm introduction to the Puente Learning Community. We are fortunate at College of Marin to have some great scholars on our campus to support our student success and our progress towards institutional equity. I am pleased to introduce you to Professor Duane Big Eagle, faculty in our social sciences department who teaches courses in Native American history in our ethnic studies program. Please welcome Professor Big Eagle. 
Thank you. And my job here is to welcome Roxanne. And Roxanne, you should know that there are uh, at least a couple of uh, red dirt Oki Indians here. So I'm, I want to make you, sure you uh, understand that uh, when I say welcome y'all. Um, but I'll also say uh, from my heritage, Hawe Wajashi Ninka, Wadobashki Zani, Wahoodake, which is our way of welcoming you. Um, I, I really am, am impressed with your uh, writing and your, uh, actually I was Im most impressed with your memoir today because I happened to notice that the, um, your Red Dirt uh, memoir is, uh, starts off with the fact that Oklahoma in the early part of the, 19th, of the 20th century, uh, the first 15 years of uh, 1900 um, was quite radical. I had no idea about that. That's totally been expunged from our history. Uh, never heard of that before, but I believe it completely because of the rumors that I heard early on. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. That was, that was something that was new to me in many ways. I, uh, well, I want to talk a little bit about your book, The uh, Indigenous History of uh, the United States. Um, I love the fact that you are finally making Native American history uh, more real and more accurate. Uh, it is an expansive book, uh, completely accurate in detail. And I think Native American people owe you a debt uh, for assembling a very different uh, point of view uh, and a point of view more truthful than, than most uh, Native American histories uh, have been in the past written by others. Um, I think finally we began to see a history that really reflects who we are. Uh, and as you say, you, you know, the book, you know, it's also a true history of the United States because it does counter uh, the colonial, settle, uh, the colonial uh, settler uh, dogma, you might say. Um, to me, it, it is also uh, being a thoughtful history, it's a book about the future because some of the things you talk about may point out and bring up possible solutions to many of the problems we face today. And the fact that early Spanish explorers here in California, uh, you may not have seen this, um, uh, really thought they'd entered a garden paradise with uh, orchards of trees for uh, fruit and, and uh, nuts that people needed uh, the, the mosaic of uh, garden. Uh, well, let, let me read what they said. Uh, the uh, the point that they're making was that this land was very well managed; that it wasn't a uh, a, a wilderness uh, as people sometimes think. Uh, that the uh, traditional burning practice, for instance, outlawed by Spanish to protect their cattle, continued by the U.S. government lost sophisticated stewardship of the land by, by the Native people. Uh, Juan Crispy, for instance, and Joaquin Miller described mosaics of meadows and open forests with tribal, ac tribal acorn orchards, ac orchards managed by, for thousands of years, land more like a park than a wilderness. Um, I think this kind of thinking might be a real solution for the problems we face today. Uh, things like uh, control burning, uh, cultural burning, they called it, uh, really could make a difference because of the orientation toward profit uh, and exchange of money and, and goods, uh, we lost something that maybe uh, we need to get back to. I, I like also the idea that, uh, well, there's a, 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 a Yurok woman named Elizabeth Azuz who says, we've been suppressing fire and really what we've been doing is suppressing this critical piece of who we are as human beings. Fire isn't something apart from us, fire is family. When you uh, realize that a third of Santa Rosa burned down a few years ago, you begin to see how important this kind of thinking can be and, and should be. I like also the non-hierarchical thinking of much of your book. Uh, there's a Kurok judge who uh, doesn't allow her courtroom to, to put her high above her, her plaintiffs. She sits equal with them down at the table and uh, sees, tries to see their lives uh, and what they need rather than uh, some kind of uh, hierarchical uh, uh, order of law. So uh, basically, Roxanne, thank you so much for uh, highlighting this amazing uh, and, and hopefully very useful to all human beings uh, uh, book and, and, and uh, thoughts. 
Uh, I think I'll leave it back and go back to Yashika. Thank you so much, Professor, um, for providing that context. And I think we all look forward to taking your class in an upcoming uh, semester. And so our moderator for our conversation with Dr. Dunbar Ortiz is Professor Walter Turner, a dynamic educator and leader who is dedicated to moving our equity efforts in ensuring student success. He is College of Marin's Department Chair of Social Sciences, coordinator for the Emoja Learning Community and founder and coordinator for the Emoja Equity Institute. Thank you, Professor Turner, for your service and leading us through our learning with Dr. Dunbar Ortiz today. I am so honored and um, almost to the point of speechlessness. College of Marin is very, very fortunate uh, to have the team of people and type of support uh, to be able to have a scholar activist such as uh, Dr. Uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz here. Uh, a couple of things come to mind very quickly, and we'll get an introduction and then we'll begin our, our conversation. Uh, Kwame Toure, known as Stokely Carmichael uh, from the country of Trinidad, uh, very active in the Black Power Movement, the founder of the All African People's Revolutionary Organization, worked for many years in Africa. He used to always talk about speaking truth to power. I think those were some of the points that uh, Professor Big Eagle was making that uh, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz has always spoken truth to power. It also brings into mind what Kwame Turi used to say about being a long distance runner, meaning that somebody who's ready for the marathon, somebody who's ready for the, for the real struggle. And we're, we're having somebody today who has many, many years of activism in Europe in Mexico and Cuba a friend of mine told me she was on the uh, one of the brigades, the Vince Ramos Brigades, which went to Cuba uh, in the early 1960s to support and learn from the Cuban Revolution. Uh, she's worked with the American Indian Movement, the International Treaty Council. She's brought the issues of indigenous people uh, to the United Nations. She has over 100 trips to the areas of Central America, to Nicaragua and to Honduras. Uh, she is one of the stars. It's interesting now that the uh, California State Colleges are beginning to uh, build in uh, ethnic studies courses as a process to graduation and transfer. Uh, and Dr. Ortiz uh, was doing that uh, oh, back in the 1970s. She's got about 15 different uh, books. Uh, she finished her undergraduate work at San Francisco State. Uh, she bear a doctoral degree at the University of California in Los Angeles. Uh, she has an MFA in creative writing. You can tell that by reading her, her books. I was joking her before the program that I'd read her recent book twice and that her book in Indigenous People's History, uh, which has won several awards uh, that my students have to read uh, in all of my classes, no matter what the class is, they have to read the first two chapters of Indigenous People's History uh, of the United States. She has a diploma in international and comparative law from Strasbourg, France, war in Vietnam, racism, South African apartheid, women's liberation, workers' rights. Uh, these are all things that uh, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz has done. And I'm actually proud, very proud to say uh, that she's a friend. Uh, she's a good friend. We've been in the same spaces at the same uh, time. And uh, she, I've always been trying to prevent her from causing more trouble. and me being the mild and meek person, uh, but she is just a, a really special person uh, in my life. And I think Martin Luther King used the word agape, which meant this uh, spiritual love and appreciation for uh, Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz as, as I know her. We're gonna talk today and I really want to have this be a conversation so we'll do some, we won't do a lot of back and forth, just me asking questions, Roxanne respond. We want to create a conversation. We want to know how the past connects to the present and the present connects to the past. And you can, you can go online, you can get her books there in the College of Marin Library, et cetera. So I want to thank everyone for supporting the program. Um, and let's, let's get started. We'll save some time. Uh, you can put your questions in the chat and we'll go from from there. Two things I wanted to, 
I think you were going to read something first. So why don't you read the piece that you were going to read uh, and then come back. And then I have a couple of questions we'll put on the floor and we'll talk about it a bit. We'll put a couple more questions on the floor um, and I'll keep my eyes on the chat and we'll go from there. But welcome, Roxanne. Thank you, Walter. And thank all of you at um, <clears throat> College of Marin for inviting me to talk with you and with uh, uh, with the many students, I hope, and others um, who are with us. Thank everyone for uh, for coming. Uh, I'll read a bit from the beginning of the book uh, to frame the nation of immigrants. Uh, I see it as a mid twentieth century revisionist origin story. The United States emerged from World War II undamaged by bombs and heavy population loss, which was the experience of most of the combatant nations in World War II. In fact, the United States became a beefed up industrial powerhouse during the war, exhibiting military might and including uh, the atomic bomb. It was poised to become the economic, military, and moral leader of the so-called free world. The country that actually defeated the army of the Third Reich, the Soviet Union, the Red Army, was the new adversary. US post-war administration scrambled to conceal any trace of the United States colonialist roots, the system of slavery, and continued segregation as they developed military and counterinsurgent strategies uh, to quell national liberation movements in the former European colonies in Africa and Asia and the Caribbean, the Pacific. The Soviet Union and communist China, on the other hand, which took um, uh, the communists took power in, in uh, China in 1949, denounced Western imperialism and colonialism. So the Cold War was launched. And right in the middle of it in 1958, then US Senator John F. Kennedy, surely informed by his guru historian, Arthur Schlesinger Jr., published the influential and best-selling book titled A Nation of Immigrants. They invented the term, it never existed before 1958. Uh, that book has been in print um, uh, many, many times. It's still a bestseller. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a small book, anyone can read it. It's not very readable, but you, it is easy to read. Um, so it advances the notion that the United States should be understood or defined through the diversity of the immigrants it had welcomed since independence. And this thesis was embraced by US historians and found its way into textbooks and school curriculums as it is still today. It is neither coincidental nor surprising that Kennedy would introduce this idea as at the time he was strategizing how to become the first president born of immigrants, albeit very wealthy ones, and the first Catholic president in a Protestant dominated culture. Every uh, previous president had been either um, a, an original settler or a child or descendant of original settlers, either Anglo or Scots-Irish. Uh, the Scots-Irish were the, the Scots who colonized Ulster, Northern Ireland uh, in settler colonialism. So the, the idea was to, in aspiring to the presidency, Kennedy introduced a clear context and narrative in which he could transform this negative of his being Irish and Catholic and child of immigrants into a positive. So the founding text of A Nation of Immigrants was published during Kennedy's 1954-1960 first term as US Senator from Massachusetts, two years before he was elected president. Given that the 21st century immigration 
is practically synonymous with the Mexico-US border that was established by war in 1848. It is striking that Kennedy never mentioned Mexico or Mexicans or the US-Mexico border in the text, nor did he use other terms like Latino or Hispanic. Yet this was 1958, late in the period of the contract labor Bracero program which began during World War II. A total of 2 million Mexican citizens with the participation of the Mexican government migrated to the United States, particularly California, as de facto indentured agricultural workers under time limited contracts. Meanwhile, the burgeoning agribusiness industry in California and the Southwest recruited even more Mexican workers outside the program without documentation or civil rights and subject to deportation. More egregious than Kennedy's omission of any mention of Mexico or the border is that the federal program known by its offensive official name, Operation Wetback, began during Kennedy's first year as Senator and continued beyond his senatorial career into his presidency. Operation Wetback began in 1954 to round up and deport more than a million Mexican migrant workers, mainly in California and Texas, in the process subjecting millions, many of whom were actually US citizens to illegal search and detention and deportation, forcing them to forfeit their property. Workers were deported by air and trains and ships far from the border, leaving those who were US citizens stranded and without the documents enabling them to return to their homes in the United States. Operation Wetback was a repeat of the Hoover administration's deportation of a million Mexicans in the 1930s dubbed Mexican repatriation. Regarding the status of indigenous peoples in Kennedy's nation of immigrants scheme, the then Senator wrote, another way of indicating the importance of immigration to America is to point out that every American who ever lived with the exception of one group was either an immigrant himself or a descendant of immigrants. The exception Kennedy went on was what Will Rogers told him, uh, the part Cherokee Indian uh, comic who said that his ancestors were at the docks to meet the Mayflower. But Kennedy disagreed, claiming that, quote, some anthropologists believe that the Indians themselves were immigrants from another continent who displaced the original settlers, the Aborigines, who he suggested may have been Irish. This is the bogus speculation of US white nationalists who claim that those imagined original Aborigines were in fact European. A few pages on in the text and the only other mention of Native Americans, Kennedy refers to them as the first immigrants while dismissing their presence as members of scattered tribes. Equally unsettling, Kennedy includes enslaved Africans as immigrants, although the book contains the inf infamous drawing of a slave ship with humans chained on their backs scarcely an inch between each packed like sardines. It's striking to read how profoundly Kennedy whitewashed history by noting that, quote, the immigration experience was not always pleasant. Or that, quote, the Japanese and Chinese brought their gentle dreams to the West Coast, unquote. He failed to mention the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 or its extension a few years later to all Asians. The idea of the United States as a nation of immigrants that was hatched in the late 1950s and while Kennedy was its ambassador, it came to reflect the US ruling class response to the challenges of post-World War II anti-colonial national liberation movements, as well as civil and human rights social movements domestically. Roxanne, that, give, that gives you a little bit, you know, of a taste for the writing and also for the nation of immigrants idea. 
is, is thanks so much. I mean, one of the things I appreciated as a as a professor is that you're making reference to books that are on our shelves or are making their way into our classroom. And if you take a look at uh, Roxanne's newest uh, book, Dr. Ortiz's newest book, you'll see that. So I'm gonna put out a couple of questions and we'll chat around that and then we'll come back and, and create a conversation here. I'm taking a quote from you. It says, I think, because I wanna know, not necessarily, I know a bit what you do and many of us can find it, but I wanna know why you do what you do because this is a road you've been on for, for a while here. Quoting you, I think this book is in many ways a culmination of all the work I've done in the past 50 years, the scholarly work and the activist work. That's one part of my throw out here. My other part is, why did you start the book with founding father, secretary of treasurer, advisor to George Washington, convener of the Articles Confederation, lawyer, Federalist Party. Why did you start with Alexander Hamilton? So why is this a culmination and why did you jump front with Alexander Hamilton? <laughs> yeah, um, well, as for um, my own uh, activism and, um, <clears throat> and scholarship, it's, um, it's always been combined in my mind. Um, I became, I started becoming radicalized uh, very young, uh, a senior in high school. Um, I wasn't meant to be, I think, uh, because I grew, grew up uh, counterintuitively to ever becoming a radical as a Southern Baptist in a rural Oklahoma. And my dad was a tenant farmer. Um, he stopped doing that when I was six years old and I was the youngest because there were no more farms that weren't just uh, automated plantations, um, ranches. Uh, so he started driving a diesel truck um, the rest of his life, um, delivering uh, to the rich uh, wheat farmers, delivering uh, fuel. Uh, so, one thing was that I was raised with the ghost of my grandfather, my father's father, uh, Emmett Dunbar, um, who was a socialist. Um, that uh, Oklahoma was had the most socialist of the Socialist Party, of uh, percentage-wise of any state in the United States uh, in the early uh, 1900s. My dad was born in 1907 um, and grew up in the, where I was raised uh, in, in, a, in a rural Oklahoma. So his father got involved. He, uh, he, he was a veterinarian and he had some land, he farmed, and he was a, um, a father of uh, eight, uh, eight children when he got involved uh, with the Socialist Party, joined the Socialist Party and was very active. Um, it ended with the uh, Red Scares that uh, crushed uh, the Socialist Party, deported all of the foreign born like Emma Goldman and others, imprisoned the Socialist Party leaders and uh, let loose the Ku Klux Klan under Woodrow Wilson. I was a terrible racist and and uh, friends with uh, Klansmen. Uh, and um, this, uh, so my grandfather valiantly fought the Ku Klux Klan and finally was driven out of Oklahoma. The family, except for my father, moved to, the, moved to Texas. And um, my father stayed. Uh, he was only uh, 15. He became a cowboy, uh, then started tenant farming and met my mother and got married. And, and started having kids. So they were very poor. My father was no radical, but he, he idealized his, his father. So the stories he told me um, were about his, uh, uh, you know, the, the cur courage of his father and uh, growing up uh, from 1907 to 1922 in that atmosphere and hating the Klan uh, he also hated the Baptist church because they were involved with the Klan, but my mother was a hard shell Baptist. So 
I was raised that way and believed um, uh, absolutely in all of its tenets. So that, you know, I was not really intended to be <laughs> a radical, but a lot of things happened to me on the way that I'm very grateful for. And one was just the 60s that came and I, uh, I, 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 at that time, it's kind of hard for young people to imagine now, but at that time with the uh, powerful civil rights movement uh, and increasingly other movements, the um, uh, Native American uh, civil rights movement, uh, Latinos, uh, immigrants, um, women, so that, you could just walk out the door practically and join a demonstration and, and get involved. It was, it was so easy. It was, it was a default position for young people at the time. You had to really, really be ideological uh, and resistant to um, the ideas, and especially with the Vietnam War, um, brought it even more uh, people into the and I was very early a supporter of um, the Cuban Revolution. I was only 17 years old. But one thing happened to me that I, I consider really fortunate. Um, my last year of high school, I moved and lived with my sister in Oklahoma City. And I worked, uh, I worked uh, 30 hours a week and went to trade school. You had to go to trade the, the public trade school if you had to work. And, um, and I had to work. So I went to the Central High, which was the trade school. They had an academic section, uh, but really it was all working class. It was a, it was a working class and poor white school with a few native students. And um, it was, there were a lot of drugs, even heroin around. It was, a, you know, it was a like blackboard jungle if anyone, older people remember that, but it was the fifties kind of, you know, um, uh, it was very different from going to a class of four people in my little rural school to, you know, this thousand, thousand people in, in this high school. And um, uh, so I, but it was the first year of school integration in Oklahoma, uh, 1955, 56, uh, when I was a, a senior at Central High. And Central High was chosen by the state as the experiment, the poorest school, of course, the least funded and probably the most racist. Um, so um, here come these uh, young black students at first year, they were harassed. Of course, they were very well prepared in the civil rights movement um, to, most people know that about Little Rock, you know, the behavior, but this was all over the place. It wasn't just Little Rock. And they knew how uh, they never fought back. Um, they were so dignified. Um, there was a young woman who was the leader of the sit-ins that were taking place in the coffee shops, uh, who, um, Herr Luger, who um, was only my age at the time. And I looked at her, you know, on television and in the papers, and I said, that's who I want to be. That's what I want to be. I want to aspire to that. So I joined some of those demonstrations. I, um, I changed from uh, secretarial trade to journalism. Uh, the journalism was also one of the trades and they had a printing press printing. So I, um, I started writing about racism and uh, writing about the treatment of the it was, it was the only little pocket of, of liberalism within the, um, uh, w within the school itself. And uh, I, was, I was very lucky to have that experience of seeing with my own eyes um, the, um, uh, the discrimination because I grew up in an all white, uh, all white town, all white county, is ethnically cleansed of uh, Southern Cheyenne, whose territory it was until it was allotted. 
so this was a very uh, formative experience. And then things just, you know, my mind was open. I went to University of Oklahoma. My boyfriend there was an engineering student and his best friend was Palestinian who was there, you know, had only a few years before, eight years before his family had been, um, had been driven out violently uh, by, um, uh, by Zionist settlers uh, and, and forced into Jordan. So I learned about, uh, that was my first international learning was about Palestine. I recommend it for anyone, you know, to begin to understand imperialism, settler colonialism. Um, and so I was, uh, I learned a lot in the two years before uh, Said returned and, uh, you know, and graduated and left, but um, we also got to know the whole Arab Muslim community uh, that I didn't know existed at all. Um, there were a lot of Lebanese um, who came in the 19th century, but they were Christian. They were, uh, they were Coptic or Christian, not Muslim, most of them. Um, so, but this Muslim community was very close-knit. There were quite a few. We went to some huge dinners that probably a thousand um, Arabs from different countries. And um, they didn't have a mosque in Oklahoma City, but um, so those experiences. And then, you know, my husband, I married the boyfriend, uh, his family were trade unionists. His father was a carpenter and my husband was a carpenter becoming an architect and structural engineer. And he had five brilliant sisters, older sisters mm. who kind of, uh, helped shape me, gave me books to read. And um, so I, I was really, I was really very fortunate to um, have that kind of experience in Oklahoma. I personally do not know a single other person <laughs> who had such, um, you know, such uh, embrace, you know, being embraced in that way. And I think it was, it goes back to that, you know, that um, what I saw that last year of high school, uh, what I experienced and just opened my mind so that I, things came to me, you know, if you have an open mind, that's why education is really important. And two thirds of the US public is not educated now. And that's how, you know, the right wing likes it, keep them ignorant to believe anything that comes around because education is, um, eye-opening. It doesn't work with everyone, but it really does. If you have the slightest one teacher that opens your mind, it just, it can change your life. So that, um, that's kind of a capsule of, you know, the foundational, what then drove me. And then I got completely involved in, you know, the anti-Vietnam War movement and helped start the women's liberation movement. I got involved at UCLA as a graduate student with the anti-apartheid movement, um, some exiled South Africans there. There was a whole African studies program at UCLA uh, and some of the exiled South African ANC people were there. Um, and uh, I joined the first anti-apartheid student group in the United States, which they formed there. Um, I spent the summer of 1967 working with the International Office of the African National Congress in uh, London. So these were, you know, my formative years, all that time at UCLA, I was demonstrating against the war. We started a vigil that was only eight people uh, when we started in 1965. And uh, by the time I left in 1968, it went from the UCLA campus down and circled around the federal building mm -hmm. and back up again. It was so long, you know, you couldn't even, you had to walk a couple of miles to, um, to uh, get to the end of it. Uh, and the VA hospital was next door. We went and counseled um, injured, uh, some horribly mutilated, uh, helped them write letters. Uh, some of the vets coming back from Vietnam 
so this is, you know, then I moved to Boston, which I thought was the center of the anti-war movement. And uh, it was, and got involved and then got, um, uh, got involved with women in New York and, and others starting the women's liberation movement. Oh, you, you've done so, you've done so, so much. Um, the, and, and I, 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 I want to get a couple of things that you can, one was Alexander Hamilton, the other one's around, I think you made a point when I saw you on Democracy Now! talking about that uh, even though President Biden had declared Indigenous People's Day that, you know, they were still, I think his press secretary was saying that you still have Indigenous People's Day and you still have Columbus Day and you were saying something that didn't work. So, so talk about those things to, to give our, our, our students and people who have joined some grabbing points here because Hamilton was a very, very popular uh, presentation of play. So, so go that direction and then we'll come back and I want to talk a bit about just this discussion about power relationships in terms of uh, what does this uh, indigenizing do to how decisions are made around education, health, and policing and resources. So do the Hamilton Columbus bit for us. Give us some of that, enough that we can bite it off and go back to the book. And then we're going to get back to the settler colonialism side right there. Right. Thanks. Yeah, I um, well, you know, I, I should mention that I got involved with the um, American Indian movement with Wounded Knee as a, a expert witness, actually, in the trials afterwards. And um, uh, then got involved with the international work. So that was that new way. But yeah, I start with Alexander Hamilton, um, the uh, 2015 blockbuster Broadway musical, Hamilton, The Revolution, was really what led me to write this book. Um, it was received with such massive uh, joy, uh, which continues today, it hasn't slowed down. Um, I had long denounced the nation of immigrants rhetoric as a cover up of the reality of US settler colonialism. And here comes a cultural phenomena that embodies the nation of immigrants uh, deception. So I, um, I fumed about that. And then my editor who I had just published the year before uh, 2014 an indigenous people's history with Beacon Press. And she said, well, why don't you write a book on that? So, so that's uh, where the idea began. And it was gonna be a small book just on, on Hamilton, the revolution and the phoniness of it. I mean, the, the um, Lin-Manuel um, Miranda, uh, who's Puerto Rican, that is a colony called himself an immigrant because and his father an immigrant from moving to New York and, and made the analogy with Alexander Hamilton as an immigrant who went from the Caribbean to New York. But that's the first deception is not to even understand colonial history. This was the British empire. Hamilton was a white man, all white, uh, Anglo and Scots Irish and, and Germans were honorary. Anglos um, were citizens of the British Empire. It didn't matter. It would be like going from California uh, to New York to go to Columbia University um, today. You know, it, that you wouldn't say you're an immigrant of New York to the, anyway, the United States didn't even exist when he um, moved to uh, go to King's College, it was called at the time the only university in the colonies, uh, the only university, there were no universities in the Caribbean. Uh, so <clears throat> that was, you know, that was disturbing in itself, just seeing a settler from one colonial uh, settler place um, that, well, the Caribbean was actually nothing, uh, nothing existed outside of slavery in the Caribbean everyone there, every white person there was involved in either slave trade, which he was, he worked as an accountant. Uh, and anyone who was a merchant, that was a main commodity, either the slave body buying and selling or the, the material needs that such people had to 
um, to support that central economic factor. <clears throat> so this, you know, there was so much wrong with it. Um, I went to see it. I found it the most oppressive three hours I ever spent in my life because of the ecstasy in the audience. It was very disturbing. Uh, and these are liberals, you know, <laughs> liberal audiences. Uh, it was performed live. Oh, they took it to the White House. It was Obama era. They also called, um, uh, it, you know, Obama, of course, gave it just the greatest praise in the world and said, this shows we're a nation of immigrants. And it really revived uh, the nation of immigrants thing. I, it always annoyed me. It was in all the textbooks and all, but it wasn't on people's tongues that much until the uh, Hamilton musical. But Hamilton was also, they also portray him in the uh, musical as, uh, and this is the Chernoff book, a non-historian journalist, uh, Ron Chernoff, whose best-selling book. If you write a book about the um, founding fathers, um, uh, you can be sure it's going to be a bestseller. It's those are the most popular books. And it's a big bulky book just filled with lies and, and misconceptions and, and misleading things. But calling um, Alexander Hamilton uh, an immigrant, you know, that, that then perpetuated the nation of, of immigrants. Um, and um, he was the most anti-immigrant of any of the founders. He was the author of the Alien and Sedition Acts that was to keep anyone out that wasn't Anglo. It was during the French Revolution. Uh, you know, the US War of Independence took place when France supported, but it was the royal family. Then after that, there's the French Revolution. And, um, he wants to make sure that not a single French revolutionary um, is able to uh, sneak into the United States and possibly infect the population with ideas that might uh, uh, make them want democracy or more power, even you know the settlers. So um, this was, you know, and. The reason I was just going to write this small book on, you know, uh, kind of what the ch first chapter is now expanded. But as I um, began thinking more about it, I thought, you know, I really should take it on, you know, I mean, take it through the whole history, continue it. And um, it was, some of it was new territory for me. I am not an immigration expert. And the book is not really, um, you know, there are many, many, well, there's a wonderful archive that exists. Uh, I really recommend looking into all these books that have been written on, on immigration in the last 10 years, many of them by refugees and immigrants themselves and many from the third world and, um, they're very eye-opening. Uh, for instance, African uh, immigrants who have been coming, you know, since um, the loosening of the quotas that existed till 1965, um, they they find themselves like the Somalians being placed as refugees in um, in black neighborhoods, poor black neighborhoods. And it feels alien to them because, um, you know, race is not a factor for them. They grew up, all, you know, all with all Africans. And so here they're suddenly in this place and um, they um, don't identify, but they start experiencing what it is to be black. And it raises their consciousness <laughs> quite a lot pretty quickly. So that... You know, I, I just got into so, so much of this literature and reading, especially the um, memoirs, you know, of, uh, of immigrants themselves uh, that I, I really wanted to do more. So the book grew from what we originally um, 
envision this 30,000 words, you know, a small hardback book uh, to a pretty big book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It turned out to be, it turned out to be a, a big book. I think I was, I was so impressed, uh, Roxanne, when you told me that the shelter in place kind of worked because you were writing six days a week, seven, eight hours a day. And I was talking with some friends. I was saying, wow, that's, that's, that's a, that's a real, that's a real feat. Um, we'll get back to the Columbus thing and people can get the book and, and read the part about Columbus. There's a bigger question, which two or three people have, have touched on to see if I can um, put it together. And again, Roxanne, um, I really, let me, let me throw one thing out, which if you get to, you get to, if not, it'll be a think question uh, for all of us. You know, what is this moment in history uh, I want to connect the past to the present, present to the past. What is this George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, uh, Alex Nieto, Sandra Bland, Michael Brown moment in history that we're seeing? The gentleman, Alex Lopez, I believe in San Francisco. What is this moment where the New York Times says there were 20 million people on the streets, uh, 25 million people in the streets last year? So don't answer that question, okay? But the question that someone wrote is, I'm taking two or three things together. How does white supremacy maintain itself? And this was one of the questions I sent you the other, the other evening. Um, that question about how does this notion of, um, of uh, how does this indigenization, how does it determine power and resources and history and everything else. How does this ability to self-indigenize, what does it do in determining what the cultural space is, what the economic space is, what the political space is? And you know, what, what, what is the, uh, our challenges to that? What, what makes our challenges more difficult towards that? Is it, is it fear, is it anxiety, those type of things? So I think I'm being, um, clear there with that question. But the basic question there is that, what does this, um, this notion of indigenization, uh, what does it, uh, how does it uh, give power, et cetera? Let me see if I can read it to you exactly here. Um, uh, how does the nation of immigrants ideology seek to normalize settler colonialism, racial uh, capitalism? How does it empower of these notions of white supremacy? What implications does the ideology have on resource distribution, political culture, media? Am I making sense here, Roxanne? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, self, uh, settler colonialism is a, a process of self indigenizing, you know, mostly groups self uh, indigenizing. That is, they ethnically cleanse violently. Um, remember, it took a, a after independence. It, the 13 colonies that became states hugging the Atlantic Ocean. Um, it took uh, a century, well, more than a century, to uh, complete the continental uh, outline of what uh, the United States is today. That is many, many wars, not a day without war, not a single day without war during that whole time wars against the native people, um, but wars also invasion uh, of Mexico and the uh, occupation of um, uh, uh, the northern half of Mexico, where we are <laughs> today, that um, this was once uh, Mexico and before that a Spanish, Spanish colonies. So this, um, this sense of being original settlers, it's the original settlers, not the immigrants that are a problem. Immigrants come, don't start coming. There's no one that can be categorized as an immigrant really uh, until the Irish refugees, the famine refugees come in the late uh, 1840s. Up until that time, only Anglo-Saxon, Scots-Irish, and uh, Germans. A very few Irish Catholics, wealthy, mainly wealthy, came to, you know, 
plantation slavery uh, to get rich, um, but it was a settler colonial um, entity that had no, you know, no real um, uh, idea of being anything but that. So the, and it started that way, of course, in, you know, 1607, uh, planting the very first colony and ethnic cleansing. It started as settler colonialism. The British, it's important to know that the British were very practiced at this because they had already done two centuries of colonizing, uh, doing colonizing Ireland. And then, um, just about the time, just, you know, just uh, decades before uh, the um, colonization of uh, North America, they had established the um, uh, Ulster settler colony and ethnically cleansed the Irish Catholics. That is, they pushed them out of their small farm holdings off the land. So they became tenant farmers and day workers and, and impoverished and uh, planted, uh, you know, imported Welch and British, but mainly Scots, Lowland Scots, um, to uh, be settlers. So these same Ulster Scots that were practiced settlers and practiced literally um, cutting people's heads off and displaying them that later became scalping, uh, very violent toward the Irish Catholic to keep their land because anyone who has their land taken, you know, tries to get it back if they can. Uh, so these same people became major sources of, of settler colonialism in the United States, especially Appalachia and Appalachia I devote a, a good deal to because it's um, romanticized, you know, it's 90% uh, white still today. And that 90% is probably 90% Scots-Irish. And by the way, my father's family comes from that uh, background originally in Appalachia, Kentucky, and then to Missouri and then to Oklahoma. So they're everywhere now, you know, throughout the West. Uh, but Appalachia has maintained its um, um, whiteness and uh, Scots-Irish um, uh, uh, his historical uh, consciousness as being original settlers. So they don't play Indian. They don't dress up like Indians. They don't, you know, um, say they're, they would never say they're native people. They're just the, you know, the, the first settlers. So therefore they're indigenous and they, they still exist, uh, exert a great deal of power. You can tell from their representative in, um, in the Senate right now, Joe Manchin, um, West Virginia, because it's a very, it's, it's like the heartland of settler colonialism. But there are other examples. The Spanish had created uh, settler colonialism in very few places, but in New Mexico, they did create settler colonialism before the British ever, ever came. They came in uh, uh, 1598 uh, to New Mexico. And they ethnically cleansed from 100,000 or so uh, Pueblo native people who lived in uh, apartment-like uh, adobe um, uh, apartments, uh, city, city people. There were city states, 100 city states along the northern Rio Grande, irrigation, agriculture, uh, very developed agrarians. Um, and the Spanish came in and, and simply took all that and pushed them out onto smaller land holdings and reduced the population by 90% within 30 years and reduced the number of um, city-states from almost 100 uh, to 21, and they're 19 today. Uh, so these Hispano settlers, mostly they were mostly Basque from the Basque country, came from Chihuahua. They um, 
today, their descendants, Hispanos, uh, consider themselves uh, indigenous, that they, they were first settlers. So they had that same mentality. And it's a, a big issue in New Mexico because you know all the land that they took belonged to the Pueblo Indians and the Pueblos live on very shrunken uh, land bases um, that can't really support you know, their, um, as, as real intact you know, uh, city-states, uh, nations. So and in some of these things, Roxanne, we've got so many, and in some senses, uh, one of the things that's important about us uh, uh, educators is that our mission here is, is students, uh, and that's great. Uh, and you're giving us a lot of food for thought. I want to let people know that the it is being recorded. Uh, we're going to go another 10, 15 minutes or so, and we'll get some of the questions here. Uh, but let me point out a couple things in the chat and then go to something which uh, one of our Emoja team has raised in which I thought you did a beautiful job of. And Professor Big Eagle also, uh, College of Marin, all, the, all of the College of Marin or many of the College of Marin women's basketball team is watching this. Uh, someone is talking about a variety of groups of European Jews. I, that's also in, the, in your book, if they take a look at that. There's another question. Is there any wonder why many white people are afraid of this information? Uh, that's in there. Uh, other people are talking about looking forward to reading the, the book. Oh, my goodness here. Somebody put this in. Uh, somebody put in, uh, you should go on Netflix and watch uh, uh, the Raul Peck, who worked a lot around Lumumba. His family was in the Congo early on, exterminate all the uh, brutes. Uh, that's something good. That's get, you get a good box of popcorn and sit around and watch exterminate all the brutes. Uh, Dr. Ortiz helped consult with that, and you can probably find some things uh, there. She also mentioned Dr. Ortiz, the work of Nick Estes. Uh, who is doing some great work, and you can find some of that also there. Let me go, you know, Roxanne, you don't want to hear me, but I remember reading The Wretched of the Earth many, many years ago, and reading it two or three times and saying, wow, I don't even know what I read here, and then going back and reading and reading and maybe reading it the eighth time and saying, whoa, now I'm finally getting it. So when I read your book, the not an, it reminded me of the wretch of the earth, and that there's it's, it's like a Stevie Wonder song. It's like every time you hear it, you hear something different. Yeah. Every time you read it, you see something different. This issue um, that you talked about, the term of wilderness, uh, the national parks. Uh, I, I was reading last night. You were talking about uh, the Modoc, who are local here. They're in California. And you talked about Captain Jack, and you talked about. A clear Lake, a number of other things. So talk about this issue of, of land, wilderness, spiritual places, um, commodification of land, capitalism. Talk, give us something here on, on, on this so that we can, because people, this is one of the big pushes of indigenous people is on the issue of land. Share that with us, please. Yeah, right. The main slogan of um, <clears throat> Native activists now, and even, even more conservative tribal leaders is land back, a very simple demand, land back. Um, most of the federal, the land that is now in uh, federal hands, which is a good deal, especially west of the Mississippi and California, you know, in the west, um, this is land that was taken without treaties, um, uh, by the United States. And it uh, includes, of course, the National Park Service, the um, Bureau of Land Management, uh, the forestry, much of which a, a Native person is now in charge of, uh, Laguna Pueblo, Deb Holland. Um, let's see what she can do with it because in the Department of Interior, is also one of the most powerful um, fossil fuel um, uh, giants uh, in the world, the lobbyists uh, that, that are so powerful and real estate uh, brokers. Um, so it's a hard job, but I think 
it will raise a lot of consciousness about how this land um, needs to be restored to the appropriate native nations. There's no reason why the National Park Service can't restore these sacred places. You go to Yosemite, you go to, um, you go to Yellowstone, um, you go to any, really any of these parks and you're in wonder, you know, it, it's, it's just amazing. And of course it was the spirit, it was the spiritual centers, it was the churches of the native people. And some shared it like the Black Hills was shared by um, about five different native nations who did all of their, um, their, their spiritual life there. Um, and Yosemite was, uh, was also shared by several uh, California native peoples. And in the North, of course, Mount Shasta, um, the, all the way you know, to Alaska and all, which is mostly federal land in Alaska. So all of this land, it can't be sold the right wing keeps uh, trying to um, capitalists figure out a way to privatize public lands, but it actually they can't sell what they don't have a deed to. And basically, treaties were deeds that transferred um, the legitimate ones that Native people feel their legitimate representatives uh, negotiated. Native people recognize those treaties, but even those they've been reduced from, let's say the Great Sioux Nation, which was the whole of uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, part of Montana, part of Nebraska, Minnesota, one unit of people, Lakota, Dakota people, the Great Sioux Nation it was called. And the Treaty of 1868 established that as their boundaries, it was narrowed down from their original uh, land base um, because they were followers of the Buffalo, but they agreed to this. But now it's been whittled down to uh, little islands, seven little islands separated from each other and surrounded by white settlers. Um, so all of that land, was, including the Black Hills were taken illegally and uh, should be restored. And there are ways of doing that you know, public lands, people don't live there. So there's no one has to be um, displaced. No settler has to be displaced for land to be returned. Um, however, people who own land in the West and have any kind of consciousness, they can create, uh, you know, life estates that, uh, that would revert the land to the, the appropriate native nation. Uh, some people have, thought, have done that in New Mexico uh, with the Pueblos. Um, so there are many ways that land can be restored so that native nations can build real societies, real nations uh, with, you know, now they're so, they're, they were shoved onto the, you know, parts of their original territory, but the uh, least arid parts, uh, the least, the most arid, and the least, uh, the bad soil, uh, and also just, just the smallness, you know, the smallness, even the Navajo Nation is the largest, although it's the largest and contiguous territory, it's still not, you know, diversified enough. They've taken away most of the Alpine areas, so it's mostly uh, desert or semi-desert. Uh, and this is in the east, you know, in the east as well, uh, the land that can can be restored. Um, so Native people have been fighting for that, you know, uh, since the Red Power Movement. They've been fighting for it forever. Um, uh, they went from, you know, the, the final disarmament and, and herded onto reservations that were, uh, that were locked down so they couldn't leave without a pass. Uh, and in that situation, the, the, the lowest point in, in numbers and, and existence of, of Native people, lifespans of, of 30 years uh, um, at the most. The lifespan now isn't great. It's, uh, it's 50 years old um, for Native men. 
and it's still every indice is lowest for and including even police violence uh, is highest per capita for native people and in incarceration. Uh, so this is, you know, with with this supposed democracy of winner take all. Um, and, and of course, we know that's not true because the electoral college, at least the presidency is, uh, it, it isn't winner take all, <laughs> you know, it's like um, several democratic presidents have lost uh, by not getting the, ele the right electoral votes, even though they had tens of millions of more votes, um, including Hillary Clinton uh, and, and of course, um, uh, Al Gore. So um, it, it's a, you know, a, a fake idea, but the idea that Native people only make up 2% of the population now reduced by genocide, that they, they don't count, you know, they don't uh, count. So the left too, ha and anyone interested in electoral politics had pretty well uh, ignored um, Native people. And so they've really, really had to, they, you know, pre-colonial times, um, Native people had their, um, had their own wars, had their own conflicts, had their own boundary disputes, but they developed diplomacy. It's just amazing. The Haudenosaunee, of course, are just the, you know, masters of diplomacy. Uh, even today, the Six Nations of the Iroquois, um, they, the, before colonialism formed um, the, the Iroquois constitution, um, the role of women um, as um, having veto power over anything and women being in charge of the granaries of, uh, um, of uh, corn um, of food and um, also being uh, able to leave, you know, divorce, uh, just set the man's things out the door and that's it. So it was a paradise for, uh, for women. And so this is the, these, you know, putting this kind of broken, these, uh, all of this was broken sacred items were purposely taken by the army because they knew these items were uh, important to their rituals. So you had then native people inventing um, the ghost dance and, and the um, Native American church, the peyote cult, which were pan native uh, rituals that still take place today um, that don't require any kind of accoutrements, any kind of items uh, as it would have in the past. The peyote is the sacred item uh, and always accessible because it's a plant, <laughs> you know? And um, the ghost dance takes no more than uh, a, a a shirt, you know, a gingham shirt with ribbons on it. And um, Roxanne, you're, you know, one of the things that you've been very successful, not only have you been successful in having 15 books and book awards, but you've been very successful today in ensuring uh, that we're going to make sure that you come back uh, <laughs> and perhaps do some workshops, uh, etc. I mean, we're very much looking forward to that. And I see some people here from the board of trustees, et cetera. Uh, and we definitely want to, to get you back. I have to ask you here, and then we've got about 12 minutes left, but I've got to ask you, oh, about two hours worth of questions here. But I've got to ask you a question about genocide. And I think you said something about academia and let me see what other questions, um, here, uh, one professor is bringing you back in person, uh, braiding sweetgrass by the book there. Um, Winona LaDuke, uh, we are trying to bring her here as we mm. speak, and maybe we should get you and Winona together. Uh, 85 unratified treaties, any ideas, any plans for dealing with right-wing propaganda and brainwashing? 
So go for about another five or six minutes here on those 10 questions I just asked you. No, on the question about genocide and the one about <laughs> yeah. what do academics do? And, um, you know, people can get the book and let's count this as stage one and then we'll do stage two uh, in the spring and we'll bring you back over. Well, thank you, Walter, for the kind words and I'd love to come back. Um, genocide is really important concept. It's the only international um, human rights treaty that deals with groups rather than individuals. The human rights treaties are the individual right to, you know, civil, civil rights, social and economic rights. They're, they're wonderful documents, but uh, only the Genocide Convention deals with, um, with uh, group rights on ethnic, religious, or other kind of uh, grouping that makes a people, creates a people as such, a people, a nation, a community um, that has roots in history, um, often a common, a common language um, <clears throat> and attributes. So this was, came out, of course, the uh, Shoah, the Holocaust, uh, the, um, targeting mainly of, um, uh, of uh, Jewish people in Germany and Eastern Europe. And it also include, included ethnic cleansing and settler colonialism uh, copied after the United States. It's documented that they used the, the, um, uh, uh, the game plan of the United States in taking the West and how they took the East and deported um, the Jewish people and moved uh, German Protestants onto, uh, onto their lands. Um, so this came out, you know, with the establishment of the United Nations that um, it didn't exist during the Nuremberg trials. So it's a post uh, Nuremberg uh, uh, <clears throat> instrument, 1948. And um, it, it was devised to, it's called the uh, prevention of and punishment of the crime of genocide. It's not specifically a war crime. Not all war crimes are genocidal and not all genocide, uh, acts of genocide uh, include war. In fact, no one has to die um, a, um, technically for genocide to occur. It's breaking down a group so it can no longer exist um, and thrive as a group. Uh, it does include killing, act of killing as one act of genocide, but also removing children from the family, like the, the boarding schools that remove, forcibly removed decades and decades of uh, children from indigenous families. It's better known about Canada because they started, you know, digging up all the secret graves, um, but those exist in the United States as well and are being, um, are being explored now. And so taking children from the group, creating conditions that make it impossible for the group to continue, which would be taking their land away, for instance, um, scattering them. Um, so this, uh, people misunderstand that genocide means just the, you know, the Holocaust. It was to go, because what they saw, you know, in looking, um, uh, Ralph Lincoln, especially who who wrote the book that preceded the you know the Genocide Convention, laying out what what the history was and had a lot to do with its composition. Uh, looking back at the pogroms that brought many Jews to immigrate to the United States um, in the nineteenth century, uh, the the pogroms in Eastern Europe of uh, of. Uh, of Christian uh, ethnic cleansing of, of Jews, uh, the pogroms destroying their villages, burning their villages, driving them into um, exile, into cities. And then of course this culminated, but it started in the middle ages, you know, it culminated in the Holocaust. So the prevention 
of genocide. It doesn't have to come to the level of the Holocaust to be uh, genocide. So that's why it's also, uh, it was 1948. So it has a, a, a anything that happened before 1948 um, can, you know, can't retroactively uh, can't be punished uh, under genocide. But in the United States, the United States for that reason did not ratify the Genocide Convention until 1988, 40 years afterwards. And those congressional discussions and Senate discussion were very, very revealing because they expressed fear. Well, for one thing, Paul Robeson and, and W.B. Du Bois and others took a, uh, a manifesto to the United Nations called We Charge Genocide you know, for, for slavery. And so that had happened uh, in, in 1949. And um, they talked about Native Americans, you know, maybe they could charge genocide. So they kept delaying it and delaying it. So that would be less likely and maybe they could clean things up a little bit, you know. So it wasn't until, um, uh, until Duke Majin, very conservative California governor who was our, uh, a survivor of the Armenian genocide um, that doesn't come under the Genocide Convention because it was in the uh, early 1920s. Uh, he talked Ronald Reagan, he was a good friend of Ronald Reagan. So when Reagan became president, he, he talked him into uh, pushing for ratification. And that's how it happened in 1988. But they made many, many exceptions. Any treaty, uh, a nation state can make exceptions and they have a whole list of exceptions. But I do think the charges of genocide can still be made against, um, uh, against the United States, both for the effects of slavery that still, uh, still keep uh, the black population, descendants of enslaved African um, in, in positions of uh, persecution and oppression and economic desperation and, um, and Native Americans who, who you know, the, that ha still have trauma, the trauma uh, from past genocides that um, so I, I know that for Native people, it, when they went to the United Nations, this was in 1977, and have built a big caucus that now includes indigenous peoples from all over the world. Um, these are colonized people who have never had access to decolonization and uh, have made great strides, including the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of 2007. Um, I worked with that project uh, throughout the uh, 70s, 80s, uh, and 90s. I kind of retired from it since then, but it's, it's, it's so powerful and important. Um, and the Genocide Convention is very, very central to um, studies that are being done. So it's important. Everyone should go look it up, Google. Uh, text of the Genocide Convention, and it's right there before your eyes. It's a very simple, non-technical, self-explanatory text yeah. that very few people go read. It, it, it definitely is. There's so much in the in the chat. Uh, question about how to address these issues of trauma. Uh, more discussion uh, under this definition. Palestine would be an act of genocide. Uh, is estimated up to a million and a half Armenians, uh, the Indian residential schools. I know there's some work being done in the mission schools. Uh, there are people doing research on this. This is a topic that we're fortunate to have uh, uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz bring to us and kind of fertilize the ground here so we can go further in terms of work we're doing with the uh, UEI and the commitment at the College of Marin to uh, equitize um, to bring equity and inclusion, empowerment and agency uh, to the College of Marin and to the uh, College of Marin uh, community. 
I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank so much for Puente. Uh, you can reach them to the College of Marin website, uh, support their work. The Emoja Learning Community, um, the Emoja Village will be opening up soon. I want to thank very much uh, Professor uh, Dwayne Big Eagle. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Emoja Equity Institute, all of them who are here today. I want to give a special shout out to uh, uh, Dr. Colleen Mihal, who has been doing a lot of the communication and the graphics, et cetera. I want to thank all of the attendees. I want to thank the College of Marin. And most importantly, I want to thank, um, you know, they have a word, what is it? Uh, uh, regalo, regalo. And I know you speak Spanish, uh, which means essentially it's a gift. And Roxanne Dunbar uh, is a gift to all of us. So uh, again, you'll be able to uh, find this in the Emoja UEI um, view site, and that's in the thing. And Roxanne, you want to say anything as we're as we're um, sadly leaving our time with you? Any last word for us? Well, I hope one day we can all see each other in person and have you know, more dynamic cross discussion. But meantime, good luck with your, um, the important projects you're working on. And I know Walter, you have been at it for many, many years and made College of Marin a much better place. My daughter went there um, back, in, back in the 1970s and it's an important institution. Okay, you, you're going to, you, you, Roxanne, you will definitely see us again. Again. <laughs> you don't even have to think about that. That's a wrap, okay? Okay, thanks. All right, thank everyone for being here. So much appreciation and take good care and be safe out there.